So very good morning everybody. So today's lecture is on etiology of malocclusion local factors. That means those factors which are locally going to affect and lead to a malocclusion. So this is in continuation with Graeber's classification where we have already covered the general factors in the previous lecture and by the end of this lecture we expect that you will be able to classify the etiological factors and also describe each one of them in detail. So these are the local factors which can lead to a malocclusion and we are going to go through each one of them in detail. So starting with anomalies in the number of teeth, in order to achieve good occlusion, normal number of teeth should be present. Presence of any extra tooth or absence of one or more teeth predisposes to malocclusion. And of course, hereditary plays a very strong part in this. There is of course relatively higher frequency of an extra or missing teeth associated with congenital deformities such as cleft lip and cleft palate patients. Generalized pathosis such as ectodermal dysplasia, cleidocranial dystosis and others may also affect the number of teeth in dental arches. Moving on to extra teeth being present that is supernumerary tooth which normally will be of abnormal morphology however if that extra tooth resembles the normal teeth then it is termed as a supplemental tooth now these supernumerary tooth can be present in different locations and they are classified differently and i expect you to know this from your oral pathology classes already Orthodontically, mostly what we encounter is an extra tooth in the midline, which is termed as a mesodens, which can present itself in various ways. It can occur singly, paired, erupted or impacted, and occasionally even inverted. After that, it is your uh, maxillary fourth molar, which is a second most supernumerary tooth, most commonly occurring one followed by other teeth which can occur in the mandibular premolars and maxillary lateral incisor region. Of major concern is if you have an extra tooth, it can lead to a deflection or non-eruption of a maxillary central incisor. I am talking about the mesiodense over here. So that is what we are concerned about. A supernumerary tooth may be erupted or impacted. Impacted teeth pose a risk of cystic formation and in any patient who shows a marked difference in times of eruption of a permanent maxillary central incisor, this condition should be considered suspect and investigated radiographically. Supernumerary teeth can cause non-eruption of adjacent teeth delay the eruption of adjacent teeth or just deflect the part of the erupting teeth into abnormal locations or simply if it is well erupted it can of course cause crowding with an extra tooth present. A missing teeth on the other arch on the other hand if we see is actually more common than supernumerary teeth whereas supernumerary teeth are usually found in maxilla missing teeth are frequent in both the jaws and also missing teeth incidence will generally be bilateral so it will be occurring on both the sides in contrast with a supernumerary tooth. So the following is the sequence of the commonly missing teeth in decreasing order of frequency. That means most commonly you have your maxillary and mandibular third molars which will be missing followed by maxillary lateral incisors followed by mandibular second premolars then mandibular incisors and then maxillary second premolars. Congenitally missing teeth are uncommon in deciduous dentition but if at all that happens then it is generally in maxillary lateral incisors being missing and since primary teeth give rise to the permanent tooth buds usually there will be no permanent tooth if the primary predecessor is missing. Then you have a condition where lots and lots of teeth are missing. So you have an anodontia where there is total absence of teeth. And then you have a partial anodontia or oligodontia where more than 8 teeth are missing. And if less than that we call it hyperdontia. 
So your total or partial anodontia is generally rare, but the patient should be carefully checked if there's any history of missing teeth in the family. Although the etiology of missing teeth is unknown, hereditary seems to play a more significant role for missing teeth than your supernumerary teeth. Hereditary ectodermal dysplasia may be associated with total or partial anodontia and in these instances, the few teeth that are present may also be deformed or mishappen frequently cone-shaped. Missing third molars can actually be an evidence of an evolutionary trend towards fewer teeth. That means those people who have their wisdom teeth missing can set to be more evolved. And those probably who have your third molars still present can be said to be closer to chimpanzees on a lighter note. Well, so as a general rule, if we talk about which tooth should be missing, normally in each tooth type, it is the distal variant of the same which will normally be missing. That means if I talk about incisors, then among the central and lateral, lateral incisor is more commonly missing. If I talk about the premolars, between first and second, it is a second premolar which will be missing. And if I talk about the molars, it will be the third molar which will be missing. This is termed as the Butler's field theory, that in each field or tooth type, it is always the distal tooth which has a higher chances of being missing. Your congenitally missing teeth can also lead to lots and lots of problems. Of course, a tooth missing means spacing. If you have a space present, that means to create an oral seal so that you are able to swallow, there will be high chances that you are bringing tongue in between, leading to tongue thrusting and aberrant swallowing patterns. And of course, a missing tooth means adjacent teeth will show a mesial drift and axial inclination will change. They will try to close up the space, which is very, very physiological in nature. So you'll need space maintenance or uh, close up the space by orthodontic treatment. And of course, Absence of a permanent tooth may result in an over-retained decidivus teeth because if there is no permanent tooth, no resorption of the root will happen and hence a decidivus teeth would stay there prolonged. Next we move on to the anomalies of tooth size where we are actually referring to the seventh key of occlusion by Andrews which is your Bolton's ratio. So it says that, of course, tooth size has to be in a particular ratio with the arch length so that there is no crowding or spacing. Apart from that, upper tooth size have to be in a particular ratio with lower tooth size to have a perfect occlusion. You cannot have abnormally large upper teeth and small lower teeth. Your tooth size has to match between your upper and lower arch as well. So if I broadly tell you about uh, anomalies of size, it can be of two types. You have microdontia where you have small teeth and you have macrodontia where you have large teeth. Such abnormalities in tooth size will result from disturbance during the morpho differentiation stage of tooth development and it is determined genetically to a large extent. And thus you will be having a positive family history. So moving on to small teeth size, that is microdontia, it is broadly of three types. It can be true generalized, relative generalized, or microdontia involving a single tooth only. So your true generalized microdontia will be where all the teeth are small in general, which can be attributed to your hormonal disturbances like pituitary dwarfism and hence is extremely rare. A relative generalized microdontia would mean that your teeth are not actually small but they appear small relatively because of your larger jaw size. Whereas microdontia involving a single tooth means your problem is just limited to a single tooth and otherwise all rest of the teeth are normal in size and this is most common in the areas of maxillary lateral incisor followed by third molars and mandibular premolars. Moving on to macrodontia, that means large teeth size. Again, similarly, just like your microdontia, you're going to have three types of macrodontia. True generalized, relative generalized, and macrodontia involving a single tooth. So your true generalized will be, again, where truly all the teeth are big and it is attributed to hormonal disturbances like your pituitary gigantism, which again is extremely rare. Whereas relative generalized would be where 
actually the teeth are not big but they appear to be big relatively because of your smaller jaw size then the next one is where the tooth is big but it is just localized to a single tooth which is again relatively uncommon next we move on to anomalies of tooth shape so anomalies of tooth shape will include most commonly we know peg shaped maxillary lateral incisor which can lead to spacing, migration of the adjacent tooth, tilting and altered axial inclination. Then the second common occurrence is of an abnormally large cingulum on the maxillary incisors which will prevent establishment of normal overbite and overjet. The involved tooth is usually in labial version due to the forces of occlusion. Third common incidence is of an additional lingual cusp of mandibular second premolars which will lead to an increase in the mesiodistal dimension of the tooth. Fourth common occurrence will be a fused teeth where there has been a union of two normally separated tooth germs which might be complete or incomplete and some physical force or pressure during the development uh, has led to this subsequent fusion. So if you can look in the picture which I have brought about. So here it causes certain problems. Of course, it will lead to spacing, affect the aesthetics and it complicates the orthodontic treatment also of applying the force, where to put the bracket and whether the root will move individually or together. Next common occurrence is your germination where it is one tooth which is attempted to divide and form two incomplete teeth. So this on the other hand would lead to crowding and of course affect aesthetics and occlusion once again. Dilacidation is one of the occurrences where there has been an injury to the root formation time where the calcified portion of the tooth changes and the remainder of the tooth is being formed at an angle. Such teeth are also a problematic thing where you have a marked angulation of the root. So if you normally because of trauma these teeth will fail to erupt to a proper occlusal level and even if you if they do if you want to remove these teeth their extraction is also very very uh, problematic because of the root being inverted a lot of bone contact and trauma will be caused while extracting the tooth as well. Moving on to an abnormal labial frenum. Abnormal label frenum here in terms of orthodontics we are generally bordered and we most commonly see a papillary penetrating frenum which is present between the two central incisors. That means the frenum is low if I talk about the maxillary ridge it is closer to the maxillary ridge. Normally with development your fibers with age should be going superiorly. So if we go through the hierarchy at birth the frenum is attached to the alveolar ridge with fibers actually running into the lingual interdental papilla. As the teeth erupt and as the alveolar bone is deposited, the frenum attachment migrates superiorly with respect to the alveolar ridge. Fibers may persist between the maxillary central incisors and in the V-shaped intermaxillary suture attaching to the outer layer of periosteum and connective tissue of the suture. Thus, a thorough examination and differential diagnosis are imperative before an orthodontist plans a phrenectomy, that means cutting of this frenum, removal of the frenum for a patient. Because that, if that is still low, it has not gone high up, it is going to interfere with our space closure between the central incisors with those fibers being persistent. So if those fibers are still there, we need to remove them and then to remove is another question. So how do we check whether the frenum fibers are still present? The ideal test that we go ahead with is your Blanche test. So what we are going to do is uh, ordinarily the frenum has migrated sufficiently superiorly by 10 to 12 years of age that a tug on the upper lip that means we pull the lips superiorly and anteriorly should cause no demonstrable change at the maxillary central interdental or incisive papilla. However, if we see a blanching occurring there, that is a sign that fibers are persistent there, lingual to the maxillary central incisor. 
So this means that a fibrous attachment still remains in the area and it may interfere with the normal developmental closure of spacing. So if the frenum is removed while there is still a space between the central incisor, a scar tissue will form between the teeth as healing progresses and a long delay may result in space that is more difficult to close than it was previously. So here we are being bothered about, we know that it is a papillary penetrating frenum and when do we remove it when the patient is taking orthodontic treatment because of the space which is present because of the frenum. So I cannot be removing it when the space is very big because if I cut that frenum early in my orthodontic treatment, there's going to be a scar tissue formation which will inhibit any further tooth movement. So my point is I'm going to remove that frenum just just before my orthodontic treatment is getting over where space is just about 2 mm not more than that or we can almost close the space and towards the end we cut that frenum so that scar tissue formation does not hinder in further or complete closure of the frenum. Moving on to premature loss of deciduous teeth. A premature loss of any deciduous teeth can occur due to various reasons. It can be caries, trauma, endocrinal disturbances like hyperthyroidism, metabolic disturbances like hypophosphatasia. So whenever a primary tooth is lost before the permanent successor has started to erupt, bone may reform atop the permanent tooth, delaying its eruption. When it is when its eruption is delayed, more time is available for the other teeth, the adjacent teeth, to drift into the space that would have been occupied by the permanent tooth. So the loss of primary incisors ordinarily is not a matter of concern. However, if a primary incisor is lost well before the eruption time of permanent incisor or in cases of arch length deficiency that means severe crowding or overjet problems the spaces tend to close rapidly this is extremely important normally we talk about space maintenance of the posteriors rarely is it required in anteriors but this is the situation where it will be required so we have to assess whenever there is a primary incisor which is lost before the age of four Radiographs should be taken of the developing permanent incisor and the space has to be observed regularly to make sure and assess whether we need any space maintainer there to avoid any subsequent malocclusion from developing. And next we move on to a premature loss of primary canines. Now this is a very very important matter of concern for the orthodontist or the periodontist for that matter. This is generally a sign that there is severe arch length tooth material discrepancy and severe crowding is about to happen. And as an adaptive mechanism, the primary canines have prematurely shed so that the already erupted permanent incisors can well align themselves. So this points towards an interceptive orthodontic procedure which should be undertaken that is serial extraction. Then we are going to the posterior region. Of course, we know any posterior getting prematurely lost is a big matter of concern for us, be it primary first or second molar. In the mandibular arch, we know that the leeway space is 1.7 mm on each side, whereas in the maxillary arch, it averages only 0.9 mm on each side because of the greater size of the permanent canines in first and second premolars. And we know that this leeway space is extremely necessary for the final al alignment of the incisors and also settling in of the occlusion as the terminal plane relation is corrected to get an ideal class 1 relationship. So any premature loss of your second deciduous molar will very likely lead to mesial drift of your first permanent molar and block the eruption of the underlying erupting second premolar. So it's going to lead to impaction your first permanent molar is migrating, your arch length will decrease, there is going to be crowding and of course you are having an abnormal molar relationship. Even when the premolars erupt 
it is going to be deflected buccally or lingually into a position of malocclusion. When two or more primary molars are lost prematurely together, then apart from your drifting and malocclusion and premolars being lost, there is another big problem happening here that since both of them are being lost together, there is a loss of posterior dental support and the mandible may be held in a position to provide some sort of adaptive occlusal function and a resulting accommodative posterior cross bite because the occlusal table is lost and the mandible will find it difficult and will look for a convenient spy to be able to chew and perform all other functions appropriately. So you might, the patient might start biting in an abnormal manner and lead to a posterior cross bite. These positional cross bites have far reaching effects on the TMJ, the musculature, the growth of the facial bones and also the final position of the permanent teeth. So the patient continues to bite like that in a posterior abnormal manner with time this dental problem might even lead to a skeletal malocclusion. So just a premature loss of a tooth can lead to skeletal malformations as well. Remember teeth altered function leads to altered bone growth functional matrix theory. So here what we need is observe and go ahead with interceptive and preventive orthodontics. So we move on to prolonged retention of a deciduous tooth. This refers to a condition where there is undue retention of the deciduous teeth beyond the usual eruption age of their permanent successors. A deciduous tooth that fails to undergo resorption will prevent the normal eruption of its permanent successor or it can also be a clue that probably the permanent successor is missing not causing its root resorption and hence leading to a over-retained deciduous teeth. A prolonged retention of deciduous tooth can occur because of, of course, first thing you should suspect is absence of an underlying permanent teeth. Second, endocrinal disturbances such as hypothyroidism and hypopituitarism. You're going to suspect this if you're having it in a generalized way for more than one or two teeth not if it is happening locally. Then an antelost deciduous teeth that fails to resorb by itself or a malposition of the erupting permanent teeth. So maybe the permanent tooth is there but it is erupting abnormally in some other deflected part and hence is unable to cause root resorption of the deciduous tooth and hence the deciduous tooth is still firm beyond its normal age of being having shed. Prolonged retention of your deciduous anteriors usually results in lingual or palatal eruption of their permanent successors, whereas prolonged retention of buccal teeth results in eruption of the permanent teeth either buccally or lingually or may remain impacted within the jaws. A palatal deflection in maxillary arch might lead to the permanent tooth erupting in a cross bite. A prolonged retention of the teeth may also lead to impaction of the succedaneous tooth as you can see in the pictures down below. Quite often certain parts of the deciduous roots which are away from the path of eruption of the permanent teeth fail to resolve thereby leaving small fragments of the deciduous roots retained in the alveolar process as you can see in the picture. These fragments are also capable that may, they may deflect the permanent tooth in its eruptive path or may prevent the closure of contacts of the permanent teeth. So you have to be vigilant and see if they need extractions of these root stumps. You cannot be ignoring them. So thus it is actually forming a part of your preventive orthodontics. So next we move on to delayed eruption of permanent teeth. Usually there is a particular sequence for the eruption of individual teeth in each arch but if one of the teeth does not occupy its designated place in the sequence there is a likelihood of migration of other teeth into the available space. 
As a result, the tooth whose eruption has been delayed might get displaced or even impacted. So the probable causes for delayed eruption of permanent teeth can be a early loss of a primary tooth might cause formation of a bony crypt over the succedaneous tooth which is hindering in its eruption or presence of a supernumerary tooth which can actually block the eruption of the permanent tooth or presence of a heavy mucosal barrier can prevent the permanent tooth from emerging into the oral cavity or presence of odontomas or other cysts and tumors in any pathological formations can also prevent the permanent tooth from erupting and presence of deciduous root fragments as I showed you in those pictures if they are not extracted on time and they are not resorbed by themselves can also block the erupting permanent tooth so please do not ignore any deciduous root fragment it can actually cause a full-blown malocclusion. Then, presence of any ankylosed deciduous tooth may also cause delay in eruption of the permanent teeth. And of course, there can be a congenital absence of the permanent tooth. In certain endocrine disturbances or disorders like hypothyroidism and hypopituitarism, the eruption of permanent teeth is delayed and this is going to be generalized, of course. So this is actually a general cause of malocclusion if you see. Delayed eruption of permanent teeth is also seen in certain systemic disorders like rickets. That's your vitamin D deficiency. So again, this is your general cause of malocclusion. And then hereditary, again one of the general causes of malocclusion that in certain teeth, the tooth eruption occurs much later than the established norm. So this is going to be general. All these factors are going to have a general effect. Next, we move on to an abnormal eruptive path. This is usually a secondary manifestation of a primary disturbance. That means the actual problem is something else. But because of that, you see an abnormal eruptive path. So some of the causes can be in case of an arch length deficiency. That means there is no space in the oral cavity for the tooth to erupt. So generally, it is a maxillary canine, which is the last tooth to erupt in the maxilla. So by the time it wants to erupt, there is no space left for it most of the time. And since this is the situation, they have no other option than adopting an abnormal path and erupting into the oral cavity. And hence, they are most commonly found to be malpositioned or they can even be impacted if they are not able to find an appropriate path for themselves to be able to erupt into the oral cavity. Second, presence of a supernumerary tooth, any retained tooth, root fragment, bony barrier or mucosal barrier which may result in an abnormal eruptive pathway. Third, a traumatic displacement of tooth but that means actually a trauma has been faced by the erupting tooth so a deciduous tooth may be driven into the alveolar process and though it may erupt later, it may displace the developing successor in an abnormal direction. So it depends at what stage the developing successor was present during the time of trauma being inflicted onto the tooth bud. So depending upon that, the abnormality can be of different variations and types. Fourth, we have a mechanical interference by an orthodontic treatment also can cause a change in eruptive pathway. So this is itrogenic example, a early class two therapy against the maxillary arch to move the maxillary dentition posteriorly can cause the upper second molars to erupt into a crossbite or can impact the developing third molars. So here we are talking about distalization using headgears. So you have a class 2 patient where maxilla is in front and patient has come for a skeletal problem that maxilla is in front. And we as an orthodontist try pulling the entire maxilla along with the entire maxillary dentition behind distally towards the condyle, restraining its growth. So when we do that, if your third molar is not erupted yet, there are high chances that you are going to impinge on the space of the third molars, taking the entire arch distally behind. So you can lead to third molar impaction. Normally, if third molars are present, we prefer extracting those teeth before going ahead with 
distalization. So you have those adverse effects dentally of a skeletal correction. So you have to choose what is more, more important for you. Next, we move on to some abnormal eruptive pathways may be of idiopathic, that means unknown origin, like a canine or premolar may erupt buccally or lingually or may be transport, transposed with no apparent cause despite of all space available for it to erupt in a particular way. So sometimes it's just fate and there's just no reason at all. Then your first and second permanent molars are occasionally impacted. Third are frequently impacted by an abnormal path of eruption. Coronal cysts can also cause an abnormal eruptive pathway. That means in the region of crown. Next, we move on to ankylosed teeth. So ankylosis is encountered relatively frequently during 6 to 12 years age period. It may result due to an injury of some sort as a result of which a part of the periodontal membrane is perforated and a bony bridge forms joining the lamina dura and the cementum. The bridge need not be large to stop the normal eruptive force of a tooth. The most commonly affected tooth is your mandibular second testis molar and we call it to be submerged. Accidents or traumas, infections, certain congenital disorders like cleidocranial dystosis predispose to ankylosis of teeth. Clinically, the ankylosed tooth will appear submerged, but in actuality, the other teeth are the ones which are erupting and the ankylosed tooth is not. The affected tooth lacks mobility even though root resorption is far advanced. If left, the ankylosed tooth can actually be covered over again by the ever-growing mucosa and the contiguous teeth often migrate into the space, effectively locking the tooth in the process. The permanent successors may be deflected to have an abnormal eruptive path or may, may become impacted themselves. Next, we move on to dental caries, very, very controllable factor. Caries, we know, can lead to a premature loss of deciduous or even a permanent tooth, thereby causing migration of the contiguous teeth, abnormal axial inclination, and also supra eruption of the opposing teeth. So your proximal caries also has, which has not been restored, can cause migration of the adjacent teeth into the space, leading to a reduction in your arch length. That means you are inviting crowding in your arch. A substantial reduction in arch length can be expected if several adjacent teeth involved by proximal caries are left unrestored. So you are ultimately going to reduce the tooth size, then the teeth will migrate and your arch length itself will be reduced. Arch length is reduced, that means high chances of developing caries and crowding. So that's the last section, you have improper dental restoration. So suppose your caries was there and you spotted at the right time and you got it restored but it is improperly done. That also is going to predispose and act as a local factor of malocclusion. So malocclusion can be caused due to improper dental restorations. That means under contoured proximal restorations result in loss of arch length due to drifting of adjacent teeth to occupy the space just like caries and over contoured proximal restorations might bulge into the space to be occupied by a succedaneous erupting tooth the underlying tooth and it will result in a reduction of the space so there will be less space available for a tooth which needs to erupt an underlying permanent tooth and you're leading to its subsequent deflection or probably impaction as well so overhang or a poor proximal contact may predispose to periodontal breakdown around these teeth where you might find difficulty in maintaining oral hygiene and again subsequently lead to caries, reduction of arch length, etc, etc. A premature contacts on an over-contoured occlusal restoration, now we have moved to occlusal restoration, so if it is premature contacts or it is over contoured, it has got high points, it can cause a functional shift of the mandible 
during the jaw closure so it can lead to mandible gliding in an abnormal way looking for a convenient spite because of the high points that's one of the important points why following any restoration you must look you are not causing any high point because if you make the patient bite in an abnormal way in an early age that dental problem can lead to a skeletal problem again you alter the function you alter bone growth and patient who has come for a restoration ends up having a skeletal asymmetry because it is done at the time when a lot of bone growth is remaining again going back to your functional matrix theory whereas under contoured occlusal restorations can lead to supra eruption of the opposing teeth so your under contoured occlusal restoration will act like something which is not there a missing tooth and so the opposite side tooth will cover up that space and erupt into that space again you'll have a supra erupted teeth and malocclusion so if caries is there we have to restore it and also restore it appropriately so that marks the end of the lecture thank you everybody for your patient listening and be ready for a short quiz following the lecture stay safe and keep reading